because of Jesus, because of Christ. We as a church await for the second coming of Christ. And it's, I think I have to preface this by saying it's not uh, waiting as in, oh man, I have to get right before the Lord, before he smites me. Um, and it's like this kind of fear. I don't, I don't think that's what the church does. I don't think we come before uh, God in that type of attitude, but instead it's an attitude of hope for the complete redemption. It's a redemption. That's what it is. The Bible is a redemption story of all creation through his second coming. Uh, trailers are, are very important. Trailers, um, previews, I think are vital and they're very, very important. Uh, for instance, uh, this Friday I had the pleasure of going to my future um, school. I'm going to be subbing um, in the area. It's been something that I've been wanting to, to do for some time, ever since I got my 30-day emergency teaching credentials. Um, I don't know why I said the title like that had any significance, but um, uh, but yes, I, I went to uh, Ethel I. Baker, where Mike teaches. He's been teaching there for 25 years. 25 beautiful years. It's uh, uh, my birthday's next month, so that's that's the length of my life. That's pretty cool. Um, not to date you or anything, but um, but yeah. So going going to that school, I'm really excited. Um, and like I said, trailers, previews are important. Um, the trailer, the preview that I got uh, at the Light Baker, uh, I felt like it was a really good one. Um, so I, I go into the office, getting ready to talk to the principal. Um, just kind of getting set up, right, getting set up for uh, what I'm going to be doing. And as I'm sitting there waiting, a uh, kid starts, comes in yelling frantically, um, screaming, cussing, saying every word in the book, you know. And um, he comes in, and he's like, I want to talk to my mom. And he punches the wall, like right next to me. And I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> you know, this, oh, that's what it, this is about, right? Um, and that was kind of a preview of what, I'm going into, apart from all the other stories that Mike has told me and us <laughs> together. And I say that because I think it's important for us to realize that previews, that trailers are very, very important. And I think the Bible actually gives us a beautiful trailer, a beautiful preview of what is to come. It's found in Luke chapter 1. So if you guys want to open there today, um, you guys can. Um, but I'm also going to be sharing it as part of the story. You see, as you guys get there, I want to preface this by saying that the focus of weeks two and three of Advent backs up to zoom in on John the Baptist, who prepares the way for the coming of Jesus' his ministry. And then the fourth week today, what we're in, we finally back up to the beginning of Christ's story to turn our focus to preparing for the coming of the nativity of Christ for the incarnation, which is a really, really cool, beautiful thing that the church does and remembers. Luke chapter 1. And before we go into verses 39, that's where we're going to be parked today, where we're going to be today. The story actually doesn't start with Mary or Joseph. Uh, maybe in the church, maybe in your church experience, um, the the word, the, not the words, but the names that you remember or focus on is Mary and Joseph, right? Um, but the Bible actually in Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, doesn't start off with those two characters. It actually starts off with Zechariah, which is a priest, and his wife, Elizabeth. Now, the Bible describes this couple, and this was very very beautiful. If we kind of just dissect what the Bible is teaching here, the Bible says that this couple is righteous in the sight of God. But it's righteous. This couple is righteous, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. And after reading that, <clears throat> this is like kind of a parenthesis, this is a side note. After reading that, you would think to yourself, or at least I do, when someone follows the Lord blamelessly, you know what that word means, right? It's without blemish. Perfect, kind of. You would think to yourself, this couple is probably straight. This, this, this couple is great. They have no worries. They have no troubles. And this is actually not the case. It's a testament, and this is something, again, parentheses, but it's a testament that if you follow God faithfully, 
this doesn't mean that our life will go perfectly. And I think this goes without saying, but it's an important thing to say. But you could definitely be sure of his faithful presence, as we see here in this couple. They were old. They were childless. And this was very, very unfortunate because Elizabeth wasn't able to conceive. Now, why do I say unfortunate? Well, for starters, no one wants to hear that they can't have children, right? That's just sad in it of itself. But secondly, we know because of culture, we know because of context, that in her context, in her culture, a woman's pri priority or their primary goal in life was to have children. Being an elderly, infertile woman, wife, she had endured a lifetime of struggles. She had been treated as a failure most of her life. She knew the feeling of rejection, shame, and exclusion. When the angel Gabriel came to her husband, Zechariah, he told them that they were able to conceive. And as we've seen in the past in the Bible, when you hear stuff like this, Abraham especially, you're like, no, there's no way. I'm in my older age. There's no way I'm going to be able to conceive. So, Ga not Gabriel, Zechariah actually kind of gives a hint of doubt. He gives a hint of doubt. And he's like, uh, how is this going to happen? I'm in my older age and my wife is in older age. But this prophecy that the angel Gabriel comes to Zechariah, or yeah, this, this prophecy, it came true. And when it came true, scripture says that, that this woman, Elizabeth, she rejoices. And she says, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. It was literally seen as a disgrace not to be able to bear their children, which is a very sad thing. But it also says a lot that the Lord was present. And I say this story, I talk about this story, I preface the story because I think it's vital to what we're about to read. Right after Elizabeth gets pregnant, right after this, there is a young woman from a very, very poor background. She is humble <laughs> in every regard. She comes from a small town called Galilee. Maybe you've heard of it. She is visited by the same angel and told she will, able, she will be able to conceive and give birth to a son, and she will call him Jesus. He will be great, Scripture says, and will be called the Son of the Most High. Although impossible, because obviously she's a virgin, she trusts and says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Now, I pause there because I think this is miraculous. First of all, obviously, it's like this is a virgin being pregnant. That's pretty, pretty crazy. But second, I, I look at her faith. I mean, we, this past Friday in Koinonia, we were saying, you know, what we wanted to, what we learned this past year and what we want to learn or do in the next year. And a lot of us, most of us, what we said was, we want to trust and we want to know God more. What a beautiful example here that Mary paints for us. Her faith and her trust in the Lord is something that should be sought after, I feel like. You think about it, the angel comes and, and tells her, hey, you're going to have a son. You're going to call him Jesus. And she's like, let's do it. All right? It's admirable. It's sought after. And she said yes to God, even if her context didn't support that idea. I mean, you guys know that if you are pregnant in this context without a husband, it's seen as like punishable and you're ostracized and it's very terrible for you if that happens, especially without a husband and you're pregnant. It's like, dude, come on. I mean, who's going to believe that the Holy Spirit impregnated you, right? It's like, no. But as we continue reading, we see something even more beautiful. In verse 39, this is where Mary visits Elizabeth, the woman that we were talking about. 
just a moment ago. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the power or that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. So here we see that Mary goes to Elizabeth's house. I was reading a commentary, and it said that Mary's um, house was, uh, or Elizabeth's house was about 40 miles um, from Elizabeth. That's like a walk, right? Imagine walking 40 miles. That's low-key deep. And I was thinking to myself, as Mary is approaching Elizabeth's house, you must think that she might be a little bit nervous, at least. I mean, think about it. She's a virgin. She's unmarried, pregnant woman. She must have felt the the social judgment, the shame, and even the ostracism from her older relative, Elizabeth. She's like, what is she going to say when I approach her? What is she going to do when I go and I tell her that I'm pregnant? What is going to happen here? And instead of receiving her with this judgment, shame, and even ostracism from her older relative, she does the exact opposite. She treats her with honor. She overturns the social expectations. And you think about it, it's because she knows, again, how it feels to be rejected, ashamed, and excluded. Elizabeth welcomes Mary, blesses and celebrates her, treating her more honorable than herself. Since the beginning, God was already working on overturning the world's expectations and world's structures. Author Judith Jones says, the spotlight shines on two women that are lowly and ashamed through whom God has chosen to begin the transformation of this world. Expectation. Hope. This is what we see in this passage. And you might say to yourself, maybe you're saying, I don't know what you're talking about, Los. I've never had this expectation. I've never had this type of hopeful joy that you're talking about, the way Mary and Elizabeth had. And I would say, sure you do. Of course you do. I'll give you a perfect example. The new Spider-Man movie that just came out. There has been so much hype around this film. So much hype. It's everywhere. If you know, you know. Matt was telling me yesterday that this dude on TikTok was talking about it. I don't know if he was exaggerating, but he was talking about it for like a long, long time. And like, if you go to his page, all you see is like Spider-Man stuff. And even if you're not a fan of Spider-Man, you had to like, seen some type of like preview announcement trailer whatever right but you've seen that there's this movie coming out there's this announcement there's this preview about this movie everyone that I've talked to at least has given me a face of like literally I say Spider-Man they're like like amazed like oh my gosh this is the best movie I've ever seen I'm not going to spoil it because I haven't watched it myself so you guys don't spoil it for me but everyone Everyone, even strangers, have been giving me this excitement, face filled of excitement. To tell you that David and I, we went to Pete's Coffee on Friday. A lot happened on Friday. Uh, you know, kid punched the wall, and this happened too. Um, David and I, we went to go get some coffee at Pete's. And um, I don't know if you guys know, but uh, at like Pete's Coffee, the baristas have like this apron, and a lot of them have put like. Uh, what is it called? The pins? Pins on their aprons. And I saw that one of them was uh, Spider-Man. 
And I asked her, I said, hey, um, did you watch the new Spider-Man movie? And her face went from like just doing her day-to-day job, like normal, you know, checking us out, um, to complete and utter joy that came out of her face. To the point, to the point, I'm not lying, and David could testify to this, she was literally to the point of tears, that she was like, oh my, and maybe this is a little bit exaggerated, okay, but it's just, I I was like, okay, maybe you're like doing too much, Uh, but she was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna cry, it was so good, right, and then she was like, I'm literally gonna go see it tonight, this is a stranger pouring her her heart out because of the new film Spider-Man, and you guys know that it's probably gonna be a good movie, I mean, some have even said that their life peaked when they watched that movie. I don't know. This film had such high expectations, and they were met and went above and beyond. Now, this goes without saying, but we are talking about something much more important than Spider-Man. And I think we miss this in church. I think we miss this when we talk about the coming of our Savior uh, it's kind of like a while when we talked about this. It's kind of like weak when we talk about this. But our life in reality, our life, the way we live on our day to day, our life should be this everlasting signpost of pointing people to the coming of Jesus. Letting people know that through our words and actions, the Savior is coming to this world. Remembering that God does not call the qualified, but qualifies the called. I'm going to say that one more time for those that missed it, because I know a lot of you did. God does not call the qualified, but qualifies the called. My people, you are called. Every last one of you are called. Look at Mary. She's a humble young woman not knowing left from right. And she is chosen out of all people, lowly in every regard, to carry the Savior of this world. And she goes on to say this beautiful, beautiful song. It actually resembles 1 Samuel, Hannah's song. It remembers that in 1 Samuel, I think, chapter 2. And Mary sings, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. Humble. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. I'm going to keep reading. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Since the beginning, God has been announcing. Since the beginning, God has given us this trailer of what is to come. We see almost immediately, right after Adam and Eve commit the first sin, God comes up, not with shame, not with anything, but a solution to their shame. Genesis 3.15, he says that Jesus will come into this world destroying Satan. You see, this story that we're talking about here is the best teaser, the best trailer, (laughs) the best preview of what is to come. Christ was born. Christ lived. He performed miracles. He preached about the kingdom. Christ was crucified and was raised from the dead. And he says that he will come back one day to judge the living and the dead. We, my people, are supposed to be signposts. We are supposed to be the ones pointing people to Jesus. We, like Elizabeth 
and Mary have this faith, should have this faith of looking at what God has done in the past and what he will do for the future. Christianity, like I've said in the past, is like a paradox. It's what we have and what is to come. It's full of it. The Bible is full of paradox, and this is one of them. We have the light of the world, yet we see what is to come. And today, in this season of Advent, or this this day of, of Advent, we look forward to the love that Jesus has bestowed and will bestow on all his people. If you want to talk about love, look at Jesus. If you want to look at mercy, look at Jesus. If you want to look at the grace, real grace, look at Jesus, because he is the fountain where all good comes from. As we stay here, the question comes, where should we go? What do I do after this? I look back at Elizabeth's life, and she sees beyond Mary's shamefulness. The shamefulness of Mary's situation to the reality of God's love at work, even among those society rejects and excludes. It's very easy for you and I, from our position, from our standing, to look at others with judgment, to look at others with this societal, ugh, we're better than you, even though we don't say that. Looking at Mary's life, being humble in every regard, instead of questioning (laughs) the angel, she accepts and she says yes. I pray for us that we, like Elizabeth and Mary, trust God that he is coming to save and free us. May we, like them, give thanks that God has taken away our shame because he has And respond to God's love by welcoming all that are shameful. May we, like them, become a community that supports each other as we hope and wait for God. Because remember, God does not call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. And I think this prayer sums it up perfectly. It's a prayer that we've said in the past, and it really motivates me to to see how my life should be transformed. Lord, make me an instrument of peace. Where there is hatred, may I bring love. Where there is wrong, may I bring the spirit of forgiveness. Where there is discord, may I bring harmony. Where there is error, may I bring truth. Where there is doubt, may I bring faith. Where there is despair, may I bring hope. Where there are shadows, may I bring light. Where there is sadness, may I bring joy. Lord, grant me that I may seek rather than to comfort, rather to comfort than to be comforted, rather to to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is by self forgetting that one finds, it is by forgiving that one is forgiven. It is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. The fact that God chooses to love us despite our flaws, the fact that he has no need for you, no need for us, perfectly illustrates how perfect his love truly is. Think about it. He didn't need us. Yet he demonstrates his perfect love through Christ. The call for this afternoon is to take some time to reflect on how God's love has impacted your life. My people, let us figure out some tangible way this season to show the origin and the source of how much his love really means to you. As we reflect on God's love and saving work, let us remember that we are not only saved from death and sin. Pastor Tony uh, is the one that said this. I can't take credit for it. He said we are not only saved from death and sin, but we are saved for. 
You see the difference? We're not only saved from, but we're saved for the participation of his mission. Being like Elizabeth and having that childlike faith of Mary, let us pray together to do this all together and reflect on his hope, peace, joy, and ultimately love. Why don't we stand up and pray?